Hello, I'm Nick Gowing. Welcome to the Emmanuel Centre here in London for this Intelligence Squared debate on whether the nuclear deal with Iran will or will not make the world a safer place. The nuclear deal was reached in July between Iran and six world powers, the US, UK, Germany, R France, Russia and China. Tehran will halt its nuclear weapons program. In return, sanctions that have been crippling Iran's economy for more than a decade will be lifted progressively. So the motion for this debate, the nuclear deal with Iran won't make the world a safer place. We have an excellent panel for you here. Arguing for the motion, Emily Landau, head of the Arms Control and Regional Security Program at the Institute for National Security Studies at Tel Aviv University in Israel. Welcome. And Professor Alan Dershowitz, one of America's most celebrated lawyers. His latest book is The Case Against the Iran Deal. Against the motion, we have Jack Straw. He was Foreign Secretary under Tony Blair from 2001 to 2006, and he has just returned from visiting Iran. And Norman Lamont. Lord Lamont was UK Chancellor of the Exchequer under John Major in the early 1990s. He's Chairman of the British Iranian Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to you all. Well, shortly, you'll be hearing from all four panelists, two for the motion, two against. I will then throw the debate open to you on the floor. Let's get the opening statements now from the panelists. Speaking first for the motion, Dr. Emily Landau has written and lectured extensively on the proliferation challenges posed by Iran. Dr. Landau, the floor is yours. Please welcome. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In remarks at the Carnegie Endowment in Washington, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said he's absolutely convinced that the United States, its allies, and the world will be safer if Iran doesn't have and isn't anywhere near to getting nuclear weapons. I think we can all agree to this, and this is indeed what the idea was behind the deal announced in July. But then he continued by saying that the verification measures and the transparency in the deal mean that the United States will know whether or not Iran is getting close to a weapon. And it's here where things begin to unravel. So let's take a quick look at the deal and why it won't make the world a safer place. First, it does not prevent Iran from attaining nuclear weapons, rather, the success of this deal critically depends on Iran upholding the terms and not cheating. Now think about it. It took the international community 12 long years to get this agreement. How likely do you think it is that they are going to be looking for violations that might now jeopardize this deal? And if they do focus on a violation, will there really be enough time to make and execute the necessary decisions? Like, is this indeed a violation? Is it a significant violation? What can we do about it? What should we do about it? Who will do it? And how is Iran likely to react? Can we really expect effective solutions in a reasonable time frame? And I want to remind you, with regard to the so-called snapback sanctions, Iran has already said, if sanctions are reimposed on Iran, this will be cause for Iran to leave the deal in part or in whole. This Iranian threat is worked into the text of the deal. The second reason why this deal is not going to make the world a safer place is that it doesn't alter Iran's motivation to go nuclear. And yet, the deal will sunset after 10 to 15 years, regardless of Iran's behavior. Finally, the deal works against the world being a safer place in a third sense. Indications that the deal is already undermining 
the global nonproliferation regime. Saudi Arabia has made similar statements about getting the same nuclear rights that Iran got in the deal. This is a serious challenge for nonproliferation efforts. Now, having said all this, as an expert on nuclear nonproliferation and arms control, I'm sure that there are those of you in the audience that are viewing me primarily as an Israeli. And I'm sure some of you at least might be thinking, you know, who am I to criticize? So I want to explain to you why I have no qualms about supporting the motion also as an Israeli. The fact that you can attach the word nuclear to two states does not make those two states identical. Israel has a policy of nuclear ambiguity for over 45 years. It's about keeping a low profile. It's about a record of restraint and responsibility in the nuclear realm. No testing, no nuclear threats, no talking about whatever capability Israel has. Israel is focused on one thing only in the nuclear realm, and that is to deter a threat to its very existence, ensuring that it is not annihilated. That's it. As a sovereign state, Israel made a decision back in the late 1960s not to join the NPT, and thus Israel never made a commitment in this regard. Same as India, same as Pakistan. And Israel has paid a price for this decision in terms of civilian nuclear cooperation. Now let's consider Iran. Horrific rhetoric directed towards the United States and Israel. Hegemonic moves in the Middle East. So Iran's record in the nuclear realm is obviously quite problematic. Moreover, when we consider Iran's motivation in the nuclear realm, unlike Israel, there's no basis for assuming that Iran is purely defensively oriented. So images are one thing, but we must focus on realities on the ground, and they can be quite different from what we sometimes assume. Thank you very much. Dr. Emily Landau speaking for the motion, the first speaker for the motion. Let's get the first speaker against the motion, Jack Straw, Foreign Secretary under British Prime Minister Tony Blair. And uh, I should say that uh, Mr. Straw led a British parliamentary delegation to Tehran in 2014, and he's just been on a visit to Iran. Jack Straw, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This motion is wrong. The deal between Iran and major world powers made on the 14th of July this year has already made the world a safer place. Moreover, those arguing against the deal fail comprehensively to come up with any credible alternative. Not one word in what Emily had to say was about the alternative uh, to this deal. There is no better deal available. This one took 12 years of complex negotiations. And the only alternatives are stalemate, doing nothing, or what I regard as the insane notion that bombing Iran will bring that country back to the negotiating table, and that uh, will make the world a safer place. It won't, uh, and it can't. Israel has legitimate security concerns, but I've always found it difficult to accept arguments from Israel about why other countries should accept their obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty when Israel, a nuclear armed state, has always ref refused to accept any external obligations, whatever, in respect of its nuclear weapons. In late 2002, it became clear that Iran had developed nuclear facilities which they'd failed to disclose under the treaty and which could have been used to develop nuclear weapons. With my French and German counterparts, I began the negotiations with Iran to bring them into the compliance with their treaty obligations. When the moderate President Khatami was in power, we made considerable progress to achieving a deal, but never clinched one. President Khatami, who provided extensive help for the US invasion of Afghanistan, was rewarded for his efforts by President Bush's extraordinary decision to bracket Iran with Iraq and North Korea 
as an axis of evil. And when Hartemy left office, at the time when we could and should have done a deal, Iran had no more than 200 centrifuges by which to enrich uranium. When the benighted, appalling regime of Ahmadinejad ended in 2013, and Rouhani was elected, Iran had closer to 20,000 centrifuges. Sanctions against Iran, tightened because of Ahmadinejad's obduracy, obviously were having an adverse effect on the Iranian economy and its people. President Rouhani judged that Iran's future lay in ending his country's isolation, and happily for the rest of the world, President Obama judged that the only way to resolve the standoff with Iran was by negotiation and not war. And the joint comprehensive plan of action between Iran, the US and other world powers, agreed in July this year, is one of the most thorough such agreements ever reached. So what are the alternatives of military strikes on Iran's nuclear facilities? Elements in Israel and some in the United States have been threatening these for nearly a decade. If military strikes were such a brilliant idea, why weren't they used on the Ahmadinejad regime when Iran really was diplomatically isolated? As Mayor Dagan, former head of Mossad, the external intelligence agency of Israel, has pointed out, military strikes would strengthen the hardliners in the Iranian regime, unite its people against Israel, lead to a collapse, an immediate collapse of international sanctions, and indeed hasten the day when Iran did become a nuclear weapons power. Such action would also leave Israel more isolated than ever. Israel is for sure entitled to live in peace and security within its internationally agreed borders. This deal provides the Israeli people with that security at a time of bloodshed, desperation and despair across much of the Middle East this deal is the best news there has been for years, to make the Middle East and the world a safer place. It will do that, and the deal deserves our unflinching support. Thank you very much indeed. Jack Straw, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to our second and final speaker for the motion, Professor Alan Dershowitz, one of America's most celebrated lawyers with high-profile clients like Patty Hearst, uh, Leona Helmsley, and O.J. Simpson. His latest book is The Case Against the Iran Deal. Alan Dershowitz, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me to join this distinguished uh, panel. I am very happy to have learned from uh, Mr. Straw that he agrees, certainly, that an Iranian regime with a nuclear arsenal would not make the world a safer place. I think we have consensus on that issue. I hope that consensus will continue. Mr. Straw argues that the United States should not have called Iran part of the axis of evil, but certainly he agrees that the United States is correct in putting Iran on the list, indeed at the head of the list, of states that sponsor terrorism. I don't think anybody can dispute that claim. And finally, I hope we will all agree that a wealthy and powerful Iranian tyrannical regime that today kills executes, gays, dissidents, Christians, Baha'is, Sunni Arabs, and others, that giving them increased power to put that kind of restriction on their own citizens will not make the world a better place. Now, if we can agree on all those propositions, then I think the debate becomes one about means rather than ends. Will this deal make it more likely or less likely that those agreed upon goals will be achieved. I think there can be no doubt the determination of the Iranian regime to develop a nuclear arsenal. Even Iran's former president, Rafsanjani, one of the more liberal presidents, has acknowledged that Iran met with the man behind Pakistan's nuclear bomb in an effort to secure nuclear weapons back during the war with Iraq. And this is the same Rafsanjani who described Israel as a one-bomb state. 
and said that if Iran developed nuclear weapons and bombed Tel Aviv, they would kill three to five million Israelis, and that would be the end of the nation state of the Jewish people. And even if Israel retaliated and bombed Tehran and killed 20 million Muslims, quote, the trade-off would be worth it, because it would be the end of the Jewish state and Islam would continue to thrive. Nor can there be any dispute that this deal, even if fully complied with, allows Iran to break out its nuclear weapons after a relatively short period of time. Now, we have to get that issue on the table, and we haven't heard from Mr. Straw what he thinks this deal says about when Iran is permitted to develop nuclear weapons. In my book, The Case Against the Iran Deal, I quote President Obama as saying that he should be judged, quote, on one thing. Does this deal prevent Iran from breaking out with a nuclear weapon for the next 10 years? So, in exchange for perhaps a decade during which Iran will develop nuclear triggers, delivery systems, and know-how, but not an actual bomb if it complies with the deal, in exchange for that 10-year delay, what is Iran getting? Iran is getting hundreds of millions of dollars of sanction relief, plus the ability to earn even more without ending its support for terrorism, without ending its support for Assad's brutal mass murder, and without ending its intrusion in other countries and its repression and execution of its own citizens. This is not the deal that President Obama promised me when he invited me into the Oval Office before his last election, looked me in the eye and said, Alan, you know me, you've known me for a long time, I don't bluff. Iran will never be allowed to develop nuclear weapons. I don't believe in containment. I believe in prevention. I don't believe in postponement. I believe in never allowing Iran to develop nuclear weapons. But this deal crossed virtually every one of President Obama's red lines. Let's now talk about the alternatives to the deal. The alternatives to the deal are multifold. I'm not in favor of a military strike on Iran, but I'm certainly not in favor of taking the military option off the table which is why in my book I propose an alternative. The United States Congress should pass a statute saying we take seriously Iran's statement at the beginning of the deal that we will never under any circumstances acquire nuclear weapons. We take that seriously and we make that part of the deal. We authorize the President of the United States to take whatever action is necessary to assure that Iran will never under any circumstances develop nuclear weapons. So my view is the goal of the deal is to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons forever. Any deal that doesn't do that makes the world a less safe place. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Alan Dershowitz speaking for the motion. The second voice against the motion, Lord Lamont, as Norman Lamont, Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1990 to 1993, and uh, Chairman of the British Iranian Chamber of Commerce. Norman Lamont, the floor is yours. M Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I too agree that it would be highly dangerous if Iran were to acquire a nuclear weapon. It would be enormously destabilizing and dangerous for the Middle East. In my view, this is a historic deal which will, without force, verifiably prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. It's the result of 20 months of intense negotiations between Iran and the US the US plus Russia, plus China, plus the UK, plus France, plus Germany. All those governments think this is the right deal. American Republican presidential candidates predictably disagree. So do hardliners in Iran. There's a lot of opposition in Iran. And so does Prime Minister Netanyahu. But he's been predicting that Iran was a year away from a bomb for the last seven years. This agreement cuts off Iran's pathway to a nuclear weapon. Firstly, the plutonium route. Iran's heavy water reactor will be filled with concrete and unable to be used again. Iran currently has enough enriched uranium to build 10 nuclear bombs. When it's reduced, it won't have enough uranium even for a single bomb, and that cap will last 15 years. What happens if Iran cheats? There will be automatic snapback of UN sanctions. 
Any one of the six countries involved can ensure the reimposition of UN sanctions, and there can be no veto. So Iran will not be free to develop nuclear weapons, but UN members will be free to use force if there is any evidence that Iran is developing nuclear weapons illegally. Iran strongly denies that it has a nuclear weapons program. That view has been confirmed not once but twice by the CIA and the U.S. National Intelligence Estimate that concluded Iran abandoned any attempts at a nuclear weapons program well over a year ago. Professor Dershowitz disagrees with the CIA. I've got Professor Dershowitz's book here, and I wondered why he was so sure the CIA were wrong. I have this book. On page 37, he quotes the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, urging the Iranian military, and I quote, to have two nuclear bombs ready to go off in January 2005, or you are not Muslims. I wondered what happened to those two bombs. I was puzzled by Mr. Khamenei's statement. Since he publicly denies that Iran wants a nuclear weapon, would he publicly have said this remark attributed to him? What is the source of Professor Dershowitz's quote? It's a Mr. Jerome Corsi, who I looked up on the internet, and according to Wikipedia, he's a conspiracy theorist known for numerous inaccuracies. <laughs> Mr. Corsi, Mr. Corsi is one of those who propagated the theory that President Obama was not an American citizen. Another of, his theories, another of his theories was that the United States was funding Iran to acquire nuclear weapons, a very strange source for you to have used, Professor Dershowitz. I agree with Professor Dershowitz, though, that sincerity is subject to proof and good words are not enough. I agree that there is a lot wrong with Iran, its hostility to Israel, its appalling human rights record, but I doubt that that record is worse than that of Egypt or Saudi Arabia, and we don't hear much from the West about that. <laughs> the revolutionaries are growing old and have a country to run. It is a country with significant elements of democracy. It has a large Christian population and also a significant Jewish population, the largest but small Jewish population in the Middle East outside Israel. Iran, unfortunately, has many reasons to be distrustful of the West. The coup against Dr. Mossadegh simply because he wanted Iran's oil for Iran rather than for the UK. Our maintaining the Shah in power along with the notorious Mossad-supported secret police Savak. And then there was the help the West gave Saddam Hussein when he invaded in Iran. It's impossible to understand the, security, the insecurity and the mentality of Iran without understanding the Iran-Iraq war and the fact that they lost almost as many people in that war as we lost in the Second World War. I believe that this deal gives us the best hope of improving the relations with Iran. We have surely learned enough from our disastrous actions in the past to prefer a negotiated settlement rather than to push us yet again into another catastrophic war in the Middle East. Norman Lamont, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the seconder uh, against the motion. Now, I'm going to open it up uh, in a moment, and so can we mobilize the microphones, please? But before, let me give you an idea of how you were thinking when you came in to this debate. For the motion, 34%. Against the motion, 43%. 23% of you are not sure yet. So there's a lot to play for in this debate now, as you can see, by the tightness of the percentages as you came into the room. Right, hands up, please. Right, let me hear from you first. I am against the motion. I believe the deal does make the world a safer place. But what I'd like to ask is, this is the nuclear deal. If the nuclear deal delivers a nuclear weapons-free Iran, but does lead to an Iran that can strengthen its support for terrorism,
that is more enabled to repress its own people, that is enabled to conduct other international misconduct on a greater scale, do both sides think that that is still a deal worth pursuing or whether or not that would be a deal worth pursuing on the proposition? Thank you very much indeed. The microphone over there, please. Thank you. I commend Jack Straw on his speech. He was very careful with his selection of words. Inspection is paramount. I am for this motion, by the way. Inspection is paramount to this deal. Why did Jack Straw say a degree of inspection as opposed to saying a complete inspection? Thank you. Yes, there's a woman, a woman there, please. Can we get the microphone there? I thought that Jack Straw and Norman Lamont's speech was excellent, and particularly Norman Lamont's, where he explained some of the backdrop about the Mossad Der, the Shah, and the Iran-Iraq war. And also, really, at the present situation, Iran is surrounded by countries that all have nuclear weapons um, and are in a very difficult situation. So, thank you. Thank you. Right, let me ask you, each of the panelists, to pick up uh, those points. But Alan Dershowitz, I've got to come to you first because um, we heard from Norman Lamont that he said that essentially some of your evidence in your argument is provided by conspiracy theorists who are discredited. So that discredits much of your argument. Well, first of all, none of the arguments I made here were those that he cited. He dug into my book and he found one quote that you do point to, and I regret having used that source. But let's discount that for a second. Let's assume Rouhani didn't say that, and let's go to what Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Lamont also said. He pointed to the fact that Iran is this wonderful country that has so many Jews. The Jews are prisoners in Iran. They all want to come out. They won't be allowed to leave. Yes, there is a Jewish representative in parliament. It's a quota. There are a lot of other questions out there, um, and you wanted to answer one or two of them as well, uh, Jack Straw and Lord Lamont. A gentleman in the back. Um, asked about the, the nuclear deal and said, would it strengthen support for terrorism and repression internally? I don't believe so. The people who are opposed to this deal in Iran are those who actively support terrorism and repression, and it's Rouhani and the reformists who are supporting this deal, who, in my view, with the, the backing of an increasingly well-educated and younger Iranian population, who want to see Iran break away from its past. Alan, I don't know how many times you've been to uh, Iran, Alan, you speak with such authority. They won't let me in. <laughs> Would you like to try to arrange a trip and assure well, my safety? Well, they let you in because well, you support the regime. They uh, don't allow... Well, they well, let me in. They just wouldn't let me out. Well, I'll, I'm sorry to hear that they won't let you in, but it does, it does make it rather difficult for you to claim that Iranians are miserable when you have no basis uh, for that fact. Well, I... Let me tell and, you what no, my basis no, let, is. No, hang on. Okay. And, and let me also say, at least in Iran, unlike in Saudi Arabia, Christians can practice their religion. And we, I'm afraid to say, maintain a double standard here. The gentleman over there asked me about the levels of it. I said I spoke about a degree of inspection. So you shouldn't read too much uh, into that. The level of inspection provided in the uh, joint agreement made on the 14th of July is about the most intensive provided for under the non-proliferation treaty. And Iran has to sign up to what's called an additional but, but protocol, has to sign up to an additional protocol which provides for that intrusion inspection. Let me hear from Emily. But, 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 but the inspections are not where they're needed. According to the NPT, there's also lots of inspections. The problem is that we're dealing with a state that has a record of deception and violations. And when you deal with that kind of state, you need to be sure that they're not continuing to violate and to deceive. And you need inspections in those places where Iran has not been allowing inspections. If Iran is so innocent of any wrongdoing, of any military intentions, why have they been stonewalling the IAEA inspections for years if there's nothing going on? Right. That is a very selective uh, diagnosis. It is. It is. It is. 
The, the agreement provides for 24 hours around the clock inspection of nuclear facilities. There is no country elsewhere on earth under the NPT that has an arrangement like this. Right, I want to hear more from inside the audience. Okay, right at the back, please. I'm, I'm for the motion and categorically against the deal. And the reason is Iran has an unimpeachable track record of cheating on all of its obligations. So the key to this deal is the verification and enforcement. I think verification, as Emily Landau suggested, is deeply flawed. The actual enforcement, we have seen that it hasn't worked anywhere in North Korea or anywhere else, short of the two shining examples of Israeli unilateral military strikes in Iraq and Syria, and consider the world we would live in today had those not taken place. Once people invest billions and billions of dollars into Iran, the uh, uh, enforcement of those sanctions, I think, is a myth. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Who's got the microphone over here? I'd like to thank Lord Lamont for his absolutely excellent delivery. However, I do wonder that as chairman of the British Iranian Chamber of Commerce, to what extent are you motivated by trade rather than the issue of nuclear safety in the world that we live in today? Right. Okay, well, on, on the last uh, point, I have no personal financial involvement in any way. I do not believe that you encourage Iran to become a more liberal, a more moderate uh, regime by locking it in the cupboard. And the truth is, that, and isolating, the truth is that sanctions have very much benefited the regime, benefited the Revolutionary Guards, benefit those who can cooperate with smugglers, who can get licenses. The rationing that you have inside Iran, all this is a product of sanctions, and sanctions very much help the hardliners, whereas I believe that trade and investment and contact with foreigners would have a profound uh, influence on uh, Iran. Do you want to pick up on that? If you want to understand the reality of Iran, it is one of the most repressive regimes in the world, and giving it more money will only empower it to become more repressive. The dissident community in Iran that I represent and that I speak to every day is adamantly opposed to this deal because they want to see a change of regime, they want to see a loosening up of the oppression in, in Iran, and they think this deal will make their job much harder to achieve. There were other questions to you. Look, I, I, you know, a lot of things have been thrown out here about there being no alternatives, that the only alternative is military force or this deal. That is a false alternative. The alternative was to negotiate a better deal. You had leverage with the sanctions. And you squandered the leverage. And you know what? When there were critics of the deal in the United States, they were brushed aside. Wait, like just one more word. What about North Korea? Do you remember all the celebrations about the deals with North Korea? Where is North Korea today? It's a nuclear weapon state. Let's hear more from the floor, please. Right, the lady here. First, I would like to thank Lord. Lamont and Mr. Stroh, they are very well in touch with Iran and their information is absolutely 90% correct. You are against the motion. Uh, Iran for last 125 years never attacked any country, any neighbors. Okay. Israel, how many times brought the United Nations deal? Um, I'm for the nuclear deal, and I'm not suggesting that this will work, but I do like the optimism of trying to engage with Iran rather than doing what we've done since 1979, which, in my opinion, doesn't seem to work. I need to encourage more women to stand up, please. There's a lady there. I'm Iranian and a woman, and I'm against that <laughs> motion. Professor Dershowitz, I'm a little bit upset by your comments. They're very generalized and, sorry, with all due respect, not very informed or coming from a place of knowledge. So, um, at all. But anyway, this might be a very naive question, but both um, sides there represent two countries that are nuclear weapon states. 
And is this, would this all not be a lot easier in a very naive way if we could actually put that as a discussion, if we can just all put down nuclear weapons and deal Thank with you. it that way? Thank you. Let me ask the, the panel to respond, particularly Professor Dershowitz. You had that uh, lady from Iran who says you're not well informed on her country. Well, let me ask you how informed you are. Uh, what country executes more people than any other country in the world? That's Iran. What country executes more gays than any country in the world? That's Iran. No, according to recent reports, China. Iran has increased the level of its executions multifold under the new Rouhani regime. Uh, what country represses dissent? Uh, all dissent. Certainly, when you compare it to Saudi Arabia, you're comparing apples and bicycles. Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't have a nuclear weapon. I think we all agreed originally that if Iran were to develop nuclear weapons, that would be a terrible, terrible thing for the world. It began that way. Now we're hearing the rest of the debate has been praising this country. I mean, I think I'm hearing about New Zealand here. But I'm hearing about Iran. And we're not asking whether New Zealand should get a nuclear weapon. We're asking whether Iran should get a nuclear now, weapon. Right? Norman Lamont. Well, I only wanted to make a very brief point because I was startled, indeed a little shocked, when Professor Dershowitz said about human rights, you can't compare Saudi Arabia and Iran because Saudi Arabia doesn't have a nuclear weapon. What's that got to do with human rights? When you combine a human rights violation I, with a nuclear umbrella, that's a pretty I, deadly combination. Either we're concerned about human rights because we're concerned about human rights, or we're using human rights as a political tool. I'm concerned about human rights. I've devoted my life to being concerned about human rights. I don't belong to chambers of commerce. I spend my time defending human rights all over the world. And please don't question my commitment to human rights. But I do make the position that a country with a horrible record of human rights, a horrible record of not complying with the rule of law, should not be trusted to comply with a deal that could make a tremendous change in the safety of the world. So yes, there is a relationship between human rights and the ability of a country to have nuclear weapons. Right, yes, let's, there is. let's go to two or, two or three more voices, please. I was one of the don't knows when I walked in, and I have to say, with so many conflicting stories, it is actually very, very difficult to decide. But it seems to me, if we go forward and agree with this, we have covered everything. We have covered our back, our front, our sides, and some of the most powerful countries in the world have agreed to this. I think this nation should be given a chance. Please. Most people here can agree that Iran has a terrible human rights record with minorities, women, and we don't need to keep defending that. Um, but the, uh, the foresight keeps drawing on that, and there are lots of double standards, especially since Israel too has a history of deception and not exactly a great human rights record. So how do you think um, occupied territories? Uh, so how exactly do you feel... <laughs> How, how do you think that continuing this hostility can change the situation from within Iran or improve the, human, the rights of, human, of women, of whatever? Um, shouldn't that be a change that comes from within? Um, thank you. Right. Let's pick up some of those points that have been made. Emily Landau. The, the, the problem is that we're dealing here with nuclear issues. Nuclear weapons and capabilities are a very serious matter. If a state achieves nuclear weapons, it's basically irreversible. We all hope that there will be change in Iran. The, the people that suffer the most from this horrific regime are the Iranian people. They deserve to have a different regime that will better represent them and reflect their values. But when we deal with these nuclear issues, and we're dealing with them now, we have to deal with the regime that's in power. Um, and if this regime is allowed to acquire nuclear weapons, this will create a very, very dangerous Middle East, Europe, United States, 
and it will be tremendously detrimental to global security. Um, Jack Straw. We've heard criticism from Emily and from Professor Dershowitz about the what might have been, but the deal was the best available. The deal has been agreed. Whether it could have been better, probably. Deals always can be better, especially uh, from critics uh, who are observing. That's the deal. And I still have not heard any tangible alternative from either you or Professor Dershowitz about what you would do now, given the deal, that would make the world a safer place. And the blunt truth. President Obama, I think, said that if the deal weren't struck, they'd be within two or three months or several months from accepting the deal. So what is the reality? And, and the reality is that we have heard nothing from the other side that contradicts my assertion that this is a 10-year deal. So in nine and a half years, Iran will develop nuclear weapons. And I submit that we all agree that if Iran develops nuclear weapons, that would not be good for peace. And I think we've proved tonight, by the absence of any rebuttal on the other side, that they will develop nuclear weapons within nine and a half years. So I think they have defeated their own argument, and I urge you to vote in favor of the proposition and against the deal. All right, the absence of rebuttal. That's what Professor Dershowitz is saying, that in nine and a half years, they can start producing nuclear weapons again. Well, that's, that, that is not correct, because quite a lot of the provisions of the treaty last for 15 years. There are several of them. Some of them last for 25 years. And indeed, there, there is the NPT that kicks in, even when all the provisions have lapsed. And what the, do you need the deal if you have the NPT? What, what right. do you need the deal if you have that? If you're, you it can't rely, on the one hand, on the non-proliferation treaty, and on the other hand say that without a deal, the non-proliferation treaty would be Check meaningless. Sure. How can you answer that? You have no prescription whatsoever, Dr. Dershowitz, for resolving th this situation. You criticize the, you criticize the deal, you, pick, you try to pick it apart, not very successfully. You then say, that you don't believe in a military strike, but military That's strikes right. should not be off the table. That's what right. is it that you want? All I know is that your strategy of no deal, of, of denying this deal, would certainly have made the world a much less safe place. Why? Because Iran would have developed nuclear weapons? But I'll tell you so why. you have to I'll answer that question. I'll tell you why. Would it have been a less safe place because Iran, no. Iran without a deal, would have developed nuclear no. weapons? Because if you say yes to that, you've destroyed your entire argument. But, but, but Professor Dershowitz... Why, why, why don't you come clean? Why don't you actually say what your solution is? Because it's in your book. And what you say is that the deal should be supplemented by the U.S. actually taking a decision uh, and having the authorization that there would be a nuclear strike on Iran if it developed a nuclear weapon, and that, that should be let added to you, That's what you, you say in your book. Let me Why tell have you, you not said it tonight? First of all, I have said it. That is a deliberate lie. Go back and look at the videotape, and you will see that I said exactly that. What I said and what Tom Friedman of the New York Times has said is that Congress should pass a statute saying that we take as part of our policy that Iran has to stand by its commitment that it will never under any circumstances seek to develop or obtain nuclear weapons. That's what I say in the book. And then I say that what Congress should do it should authorize the president to take whatever action is necessary military to make action. sure whatever action. action is necessary. Military action. Let Use the you. words, Dr. President Obama, military action. President, yes. Obama has military said, action. president Obama has said all options should be kept on the table. Yes, all of the Israeli officials that you quote in favor of the deal have all said that the military option must remain on the table as a last resort. Right. President Obama has said that. The prime ministers of virtually every country have said that, and yet you attack me as a warmonger for actually quoting what all the leaders of the free world, including the P5 plus one, have said. So yes, the military option ought to be taken, kept on the table. It should not be taken off the table ever as a last resort, because yes, given a choice, and I put this to you, given a choice between Iran having military weapons on the one hand or a military attack, yes, I believe that the least worst alternative is a surgical military attack 
on Iran's nuclear weapons if the only other alternative right. is nuclear weapons right. in Iran. And I proudly stand by that position right. okay, that's enough. as a liberal and as a peace lover. Right. And if you don't like it, that's too bad. Right. Okay, right. Um, All of you that are booing what Professor Dershowitz said are so misguided because if Iran attains a nuclear weapon, war will be your, the, the least of your problems. There will be such destruction in the Middle East and beyond that you are just not looking reality right. in the face. The, right. It's easier to take that position in London. At that point, it's very clear we have a significant division up here on the platform. <laughs> Thank you for all your interventions. We have not resolved it tonight, but we do have clarity of the way you here in the Emanuel Center are thinking. Let me just tell you what the result of the vote is. I remind you that uh, the motion is that the nuclear deal with Iran won't make the world a safer place. And before we started the debate, 34% were for the motion, 43% were against the motion, 23% hadn't made up their mind. Almost everyone who hadn't made up their mind has now made up their mind. Only 2% of you haven't made up your mind, and it shifted significantly towards against. And <laughs> the the percentage is 35% for the motion, but 63% against the motion. So I declare the motion has been defeated. At that point, can I just say thank you very much indeed. There's been a lot of passion in this room and a lot of difficulty in controlling it. But thank you uh, from me, Nick Gowing from this Intelligence Squared debate. Bye-bye.